you. So nice to have you. Thank you for joining us. Jay, it is always fun visiting with you on your show. I learn something every time I'm here. Thank you for inviting me. And so do I. <laughs> graphic design, you know, I mean, if, if you're going to do what we do at Think Tech, you've got to be interested in graphic design. And you are the cat's meow, may I say that, <laughs> on graphic design. <laughs> I don't know if it's the cat's meow or the cat scratched my face. I think it's one of the two. But, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned graphic design because I look at the picture behind you. Why did you put pictures there? Why does it not have text? And the answer is because images communicate. And what I've discovered is that a lot of people assume that images are the domain of the graphic artist and only the, the highly trained graphicist can create images. And unfortunately, that's damaging to a lot of people, including executives and, and high tech people who don't understand how to use images to communicate. Have you, Jay, for instance, just to ask you a question, have you ever needed to do a fundraising pitch to get people to donate to your august enterprise? Twice a year we do that. Right. And think about how important it is for people to pay attention and for you to capture the attention of people who aren't paying attention in the first place. The audience that you're trying to reach is highly distracted and is looking for every possible reason not to listen to you. So what are you going to do to get their attention? Well, obviously, you're going to sit down at your keyboard, and you're going to write a 75 page white paper and drop this tome directly on their lap so that they can't move until they give you your credit card. But for most people, that won't work. No. So oh, the question is, you know, what, what is a graphic um, amateur like me, what do I do to get graphics that can communicate? By realizing that you have access to a lot more design tools than you think. And over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you some specific examples of what you can do to improve the quality of your communication. So, Jay, here's a question. You've just been given the assignment of doing a, a, a fundraising pitch to the business roundtable in your city. You're going to be talking to executives. What's the very first thing you do after panicking? <laughs> you design what kind of graphics you're going to use and what kind of messages you want to send out and make sure that they're both on the same page. I, you may be one of the, the lucky few that thinks that, but most of us would sit down at the keyboard and start to type up a bunch of PowerPoint slides, which are all text heavy. In fact, if you look at this image here, this is a typical PowerPoint slide. And you get up there on stage, you say, you know, two separate independently controlled long range studies show an average of 50% growth in positive outcomes for test subjects when compared to the historical baseline. And by now, the entire audience is asleep. They realize you can't read an English <laughs> sentence, and they've just about passed out. You've lost their attention. <laughs> what happens if you say that? It's exactly the same message. It was created using a font called Cooper Black, a gradient which can be done in any application that exists on any computer, Mac or Windows, with a little border on it. It's an up arrow. And yet, what does this do? It says 50% growth. Well, the very first thing the audience does is it comes back to you and says, Jay, what are you talking about? I got to get in on 50% growth. <laughs> They're not reading an English sentence. They're looking at a graphic. Where did you look first? Did you look at the body text? Probably not. Did you look at the headline? Probably not. The very first place you looked was the image. If you're talking to a distracted audience, what you want to do is find a way to cut through that distraction, get them off their phones, and get them to pay attention to you. As soon as they see that slide, the very first thing they're going to do is they're going to turn back to you and say, Jay, i got to know more. Tell me what, what this is. What text could you write that would equal the emotional power of that fire chief on the scene of a disaster. There's not a word you could put down, nothing, that would equal that. Why then do we spend all of our time, as we're getting ready to do a PowerPoint slide, why do we spend all of our time in trying to find ways to put text on the screen when the text is not going to help us? You pop that up. Duck migration, okay, think tech Hawaii, 50% and a picture not of a duck, but maybe a, a, you know, something that's meaningful, a pile of gold coins, a, a bank statement, something, but it's a picture. 
And notice two things. Number one, there's very few words on there. And number two, it doesn't answer a single question. 50% what? Why a duck? Now, this would be a a biology conference when you're talking about ducks, but the very first thing people are going to do is look at that and say, cool. They look back at you and say, Jay, what are you talking about? And you, with a serious expression, lean against the podium and you say, with great sincerity, do you realize that 50% of the ducks migrating in the spring and the fall are female? Well, you don't pay that off in the slide. You pay that off in your talk. And what you do is you're making yourself the center of attention. You're not making the slides the center of attention. And everything that you're doing in that slide is cutting through the distraction, is cutting through people's trying to get on the phone. They have to keep looking up and say, wait a minute, what's this slide about? Because when you think about it, your goal in communicating is to capture the attention of the audience and hold it long enough to deliver your message. And your message is so compelling because you care about it that people say, hey, I have to, I have to take a part of this. this. This is something I need to belong to. And they unlimber their checkbooks and they give you the contribution or fund your idea or start the company or, or participate in some form. They agree with you because you cut through the chatter. And that's what images do. We don't have to be a professional photographer. We don't have to understand graphic design. In fact, we can do much better than that. We can leverage the power of emotions to tell the stories that we want to tell. For instance, here, take a look at this slide. Mm -hmm. Together, we can create magic. Look at that. How can you not look at that slide? And how can you not come back and look and say, Jay, that is brilliant. Yes, we can create magic together. My organization, your funding, together, the power, the synergy is greater than each of us alone. Let's find ways to create magic. I'm not an artist. This is stock art. I'm leveraging the power of typefaces. I'm leveraging the power of of the way I'm formatted on the screen. In fact, if you look at me on the screen, you'll notice I'm not particularly centered. I'm slightly off center. Why? Because if you're centered, you're a very boring image. The eye says, okay, they're sitting in the center. Now I want to look. And what happens is my eye looks at you and you look handsome. You're well lit gloriously photographed, and I want to start looking at the images behind you because the eye gets bored of stuff that's in the center. The eye wants to see what's slightly off-center. So notice that when we're doing an interview show on any name, the talk show, the host is never perfectly centered. They're always slightly off-center because that balanced but off-center approach adds eye-catching interest. You have to keep coming back. Why isn't he centered? I look at the background and I say that that background looks kind of interesting, interesting colors of yellow and green and brown. And but let me come back and look at Larry. And then my eye leaves Larry and then comes right back again. The eye is attracted not to that which is perfectly framed and perfectly centered, but which is balanced, which is slightly off center. Which means that you keep coming back to who I am. You keep coming back to what I look like. As opposed to, all right, I've seen him, done, been there, done that. Let me go take a look at that fifth picture in from the left. So start to think about what is it that, what do I have to do to capture the attention of an audience? Now, here I've got a question for you. You're sitting down. You're ready for this? Mm-hmm. Look at this slide. What's wrong with this image? Wait, give me a minute. Uh, he's. I don't know. There's a bunch of things. Uh, the frame is, is funny. Um, it's black and white, no color. She's looking down, not at you. Um, I don't know. I, I, maybe it does have an emotional impact, but I don't feel it. You're going to hate me when I tell you. She doesn't have any legs. <laughs> The way our brains are wired, not just yours, not just mine, but all of us, is when we see a picture in the frame, we assume that the only thing that's real is that which is inside the frame. Just as you looked at that woman and you looked, you only saw that which was inside the frame, everything else you ignored. 
Well, we can take advantage of that. It's a process called framing. We can take advantage of that in terms of how, like the way I'm composed now, I'm slightly off center. That's taking advantage of framing because the way your brain works, it says the only thing I can see is what's inside the shot with Larry. Now, if you looked around, you'd be seeing some lights and some cameras and some microphones and about 17 different computers and more technical stuff that I want to talk about with you today. But your brain says none of that exists. The only thing that exists is that which is inside the frame. Now, take a look at this picture. The instant your eye sees an image and there's no caption, there's no text, your brain starts to invent a story. Why is Sarah sad? Why isn't the couple talking to each other? They're clearly somewhere other than the United States, because look at that architecture on the other side of the lake, and look at how she's dressed. She obviously had a falling out. Maybe, you know, maybe she was leading a difficult life. Maybe she lost a family. Whatever it is, your brain starts to spin stories, and you look at this, and you say, it's a sad picture. It's a haunting picture. Even without me explaining it, you're starting to get an emotional impact back from that image. Take a look at the next one. Does this tug the heart strings right out of you, the five-year-old girl waving goodbye to her mom as she leaves for work? Oh my goodness, how can the mom have the, the audacity to leave her child? And the sadness in the child's face, the separation of, of the child who loves her mom and her mom is leaving her. Oh, this one brings tears to my eyes every time I see it, partly because I know who they are, but also the feeling of the young girl. She would not let her mom go to work unless she ran out to wave goodbye in her nightdress, no less. It's, uh, she's trying to hold on to her. And notice that your brain starts to create a story instantly as soon as you see it. I'll give you one more example. Do you think she's happy? She could be smiling and laughing hysterically, but notice that we're looking down on her. So we've already diminished her because we are looking down like we look down on a child. The image is all blues and grays, so it's not a warm, cheerful color palette. We see her from the back, so we can't see her face. She's alienated from us. We are separated from her. This is, what, teen suicide? Mm. Depression of a broken relationship? Whatever it is. As a parent, you want to go over and just give her a hug and say, it's going to be okay. But notice how that emotion comes right back to you. If you were doing a talk and say, what we help people do is to identify people that are in trouble and give them a hand. I mean, think how that image would tell your story without you having to say a word. So you were saying, do I need to be a graphic artist? No, you don't have to be a graphic artist. You just need to understand the, the, the way that emotions trigger pictures. And you were saying that uh, you can get this uh, without being a graphic artist uh, from stock photo houses. You know, and, and we, we at Think Tank, we have a list of 20 of them. But the problem is, how do you find uh, graphics that are like the ones you have been showing us? They're powerful. How many do you have to go through to achieve that kind of emotional impact? It's not easy. It isn't. But here's a secret. Don't search by subject. Search by emotion. So when you're searching for something, type in the word sad. Type in the word joyful. Type in the word happy. There's a, a, an image that I saw, a website that I like, which provides free images, which are, are able to be used that are high quality, is Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S, Pexels.com. And um, I typed in happiness, and it was a picture of a pair of elephant seals elephant seals and the male elephant seal is just smiling huge giant smile you can't see that picture without smiling with it now when would you type in i want to see a smiling elephant seal on a search you never would but as soon as you search for happiness maybe you see a dog that's smiling or an elephant seal or a balloon or something that gives that emotion because now you're looking for that which you really want to convey, which is the emotion of your image, not the, not a, you don't want to say, show me a young woman in brown hair that's, no, give me the emotion. The emotion can be represented in a number of different ways. Well, it has to be uh, keywords in, in that site. In Pexels, for example, there's, there's somebody who wrote the word happiness in there. Um, not all, not all uh, graphic sites, uh, stock photo sites, are that good. 
Some of them won't have the word happiness. Um, you know, you'd be surprised at how many do. Uh, I've gone to Getty Images, I've gone to Shutterstock, I've gone to Pond5, I've gone to Pexels, and all of them have emotional triggers built into many of their images. And remember, if you've got five million images to choose from, even if only a million have been categorized, that's still more images than you're going to need in your, your production. Now, another couple things, um, if we go back a couple slides, go back to that picture of the, um, of the boy, in the magic images are magic that slide on the duck there you go perfect that slide's designed very specifically i know that by the way that it's designed your eye is going to go to the image first then it's going to go to the title then it's going to images that work it's going to go to the body text i can control by the way i do that design i can control where your eye goes first second third so i can actually tell a story as your eye scans through that slide and the reason is, is our brains are hardwired to go through a checklist when we see an image on where to look first and where to look second and where to look third, just like this PowerPoint slide here. So let's take, come back to me, go to the slide that says six priorities and put that on. The way the eye goes down this checklist is the very first thing the eye looks at is movement, then focus, then brighter, sorry, then different, then brighter, then bigger, and in front. Since 100,000 years ago, when we were hunter-gatherers, if something moved out of the corner of our eye, everything else stopped until we turned to identify that movement. Can we eat it, or is it going to eat us? That's so hardwired into us that filmmakers take advantage of that all the time by moving the camera because that movement draws us into the scene. Where did your eye go first? It went right to the horse, not the dust, not the trees, not the sky, not the ground, but the moving horse, because our eye says it's moving. Am I in trouble or do I have breakfast on the hoof, so to speak? <laughs> if nothing's moving and for still images, we can imply movement, but not actually show it. The second option is that which is in focus. Notice that your eye went to the woman first, because although there are dozens of people in the slide, only one person's in focus, and you saw her first. If everything is still or not moving, and if everything is in focus, the third option comes into play. Your eye goes to that which is different. There's all kinds of puzzle pieces here, but your eye sees the black puzzle piece first because it's different than everything else. The rest of the slide is white. The fourth option, if everything is the same, is your eye goes to that which is brighter. You see the woman in a white t-shirt before you see the woman on the left, and before you look past them to realize you're in a wine bar and you start to look at all the furnishings around it. If everything else is the same, your eye goes to that which is bigger. Now here we have a double advantage. The woman in, in front is both bigger and in focus. The background is out of focus, but the fact that she's bigger draws our eye before anything else in the shot. Then the last criteria is that which is in front. We see that which is in front before we look at that which is in back. And if you change again, we can use multiple ones of these at the same time. Here, the woman in the front is also brighter. She's also in focus. So you have to look at her first. Have to. And then you look at the people behind her, the two women over her shoulder, because they're brighter than the two people on the edges. I can say you're going to see the woman in the center, then the two women behind her, then the two people on the edges. And... 99% of the time, that checklist is going to happen exactly the same way with everybody that sees your slides. This is all stock footage, but now think about that image that I had with the kid. Your eye went to that child that had the magic, right? Exactly. He's brighter. He's bigger. He's in focus. Colorful, different, meets almost all the checkboxes except not moving. And then you go to that which is brighter. You go to the together images do magic, and an image just work. You've got that same checklist. Well, this checklist is available to everybody. You don't have to be a graphics designer. These pictures that you're showing us um, are, I know you're showing them to us to, to point out the priorities and where our eyes are drawn, um, but they're also emotional pictures. I mean, what, are these? would you use these pictures in order to convey an emotional message, the ones you've been showing us? I'm talking on a network television show right now, and I'm using these images. I would say, yes, I use these images. I use the images of the fire chief 
I, yeah, here's another example. Emotions are in more than just images. If we skip down through the slides, we see a text graphic. They're talking about plumbing. The color is exactly the same. The point size is exactly the same. The words, the content is exactly the same. But do they have the same emotional context? No. The one on top looks like it's made out of spun sugar and likely to dissolve in the next rainstorm. The one on the bottom says these pipes are not going anywhere. And this is just simply changing a typeface. Typefaces have emotion. Which of these two feels more like a keepsake? Colors are the same. Words are the same. Content's the same. Position's the same. But it's not the same emotion. And don't you have access to the typefaces on your computer? Can't you use these to evoke the same emotional? And now combine the emotion of text with the emotion of your images? Which of these two is more fearful? It's type. It's a typeface. It's something you type with your keyboard and you put into Microsoft Word. And yet they don't look the same at all. Or how about this one? Here, the text is the same, but the background is not. Notice how on the left, the cleanest room robot against that day glow yellow, your eye sees the background and has to fight off the background to be able to read the words in front. And the background is so intense and so bright, just sucks your eyes back. Whereas on the right, the background supports the words. The words are easier to read and you read the title with the general background on the right, and you have to fight your way off the background, the background on the left. Or here, take a look at this. This is everything you don't want to do. Driving down a highway in Nevada, I saw this graphic on the back of a truck. There's the name of the company. There's a slogan. There's another slogan. There's a third slogan. There's a graphic of a flag. There's a logo. And there's a phone number. And all of that is wasted. All of it. First, they don't keep their trucks clean, so that doesn't help. But second, there's so much going on that nobody bothered to actually look at this thing on the back of a truck. So they spent a fortune to get this designed, another fortune to get it printed and put onto the truck and to drive the truck around, and all they're doing is wasting money. Because they didn't think about, well, what do, pe what do people see first, and what are they going to see? And if I'm going to put this ad on here, wouldn't it be nice to, to hose down the back of the truck every so often? <laughs> the answer is yes. Or here, take a look at this. Which of these shots is the most emotional to you? It's rhetorical. It's the exact same image. The one on the left is in color. The one in the middle is in black and white. The one on the right is sepia. But they don't have the same emotional resonance. The image on the left feels like it's today. The image on the, the center is sort of like, I'm depressed. But the, the one on the right in sepia is an age-old longing for some way of getting out of this existence that I'm in. There's not the same emotion at all. Or here, one more. Just by the way you position the camera, which of these two shots of the, uh, emphasizes the subject? The one where we're looking at the two standing facing each other? It's pretty boring. Or where we move the camera over the shoulder? What you find is, is that when you have the camera in the center, you're showing the geography of where stuff is located. But when you move over the shoulder, now we start to get closer into emotions and close-ups. And look at how much more visually interesting and compelling that picture is on the right. Well, if you never thought about it, you'd take the handshake in the top center because, you know, it's a handshake. That's all I need. But now that you're aware of it, you'll never take that center shot again because... Why, why leave all that emotion on the table? Or take a look at this. Which of these feels happier? It's the exact same shot. Exactly the same. I just cropped it in for a close-up. Close-ups deliver emotions. Wide shots deliver geography. So I see he's working on a computer. He's sitting on the steps. But I don't get the same level of joy on the wide shot as I do with the close-up. So maybe I download the close-up, but I say, I really want to show this guy happy. So crop it in so you just see his face. Or this one. 
Notice how taking the color away makes it more lonely, more alienated, more on your own. Same shot, same framing, same size, colors missing. Or this one. Remember, I was talking about the fact that if something is centered, your eye quickly goes away from it. Look at how you look at the picture on the left and say, ah, stones are centered. And your eye instantly goes over the stones on the right and keeps going back to the stones on the right because it is a much more intriguing shot when it's balanced but off center than if it's centered. Or how about this? It's a still image, but which one is moving? And which one is more interesting to look at? And which one keeps your attention? Or this one? Which one feels scarier? Well, the one on the left, we're looking down at a toy dinosaur. The one on the right, the toy dinosaur is about to have us for lunch. It's, it's simply being aware of the power of images that, and, 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 and thinking about what it is that you want to convey. When you're doing your presentation, Jay, and I'm just inventing because I've never heard it and, and you've never shared it with me, but what you want to do is you want to reassure people that you are a reputable organization, that you're doing good work, that you're worth being supported, which means that you need to convey solidity, stability, trust, and the fact that Together, we can grow this into something more than it already is. So the images that you want to use and the slides you want to put up should not deafen people with thousands of words. It should work on how do I reinforce trust? How do I reinforce stability? How do I reinforce the fact that I am a reputable, honorable man? And the people that you're working with are exactly like you. That doesn't require writing tomes and putting lots of diagrams on a PowerPoint slide. It requires thinking about what your real message is, and the real message is I can be trusted. I'm worth your fundraising dollar. I'm worth you spending time with. I'm worth you learning more, because the world will be a better place if together we make this happen. And that doesn't require a graphic artist. That just requires someone that looks at art from the perspective of what emotion does this convey, and how does that emotion rub back on me? From typefaces, to page layout, to selecting images. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Oh, there's so much in there, what you've said. So let's have a case study. So I want to, I want to develop a trust relationship. I want to demonstrate that I can be trusted, that I'm the kind of person um, you know, that they should send a check to, for example, in the business context. Um, so here I am on Pexels or Shutterstock or whatever you have, uh, whatever you know, stock photo uh, opportunities you have. Um, what words would you put in to achieve a photo that would have the maximum power? I wouldn't necessarily, without hearing the whole speech, but just hearing that sketch. The stuff that I would be talking about would be partnerships, people working together, people cooperating handshakes, a, a, some, a discussion perhaps. But what you want to do is, is, is that you really need to have people partner with you to grow your organization. It isn't you by yourself, and it isn't the team behind you, and it isn't just the audience. It's your supporters, it's your audience, it's your team, and it's you. And when that partnership gets developed, now we can start to talk about cooperation, we can talk partnership, we can talk mentoring, we can talk uh, trust, all of these. There's lots of images that go with all of those. But what we're talking is, is emphasizing the emotion. Nobody's going to give you a dime if they don't trust you. They won't give anybody a dime if they don't trust you. The first thing you have to establish is trust. The second you have to is that you're not only are you trustworthy, but people are going to be able to know that their money is going to be well spent that you're going to put that money to good use and you're going to use it to develop whatever your next project happens to be. So they've got to get a sense that you have a vision, you know where you're going, you know how you need to get there, you need resources to make it happen. 
And the only way those resources are going to become available is for you to be trustworthy, believable, honest. And then from there, people say, okay, I'm going to commit this. Then they're going to turn to their significant other and say, I'm going to invest $10,000 in this. And the significant other is going to say, well, how come? Well, what they've made inside is they've made an emotional decision. I trust Jay. I'm going to give Jay my money. That's an emotional decision. Then they're going to turn to their significant other or their friends or the business associates and say, I just gave $10,000 to, to the Think Tech Hawaii. Because they're a reputable organization, they have high ratings, they've got good numbers, the YouTube numbers, are, they're going to justify it with logic. But the decision is emotional. All decisions are emotional. Profit never factors into it. It's do I believe this person and can I make a difference? Once you hook them emotionally, then they'll find the reason to justify why they're doing. But the real reason is because they believe you. What about the true. connection, Larry, between the, the, the graphics and the words? There's got to be a connection. It's got to be consistent. One has to reinforce the other. Can you talk about that? I can, but it would take another hour. If I can show the last slide, about a year and a half ago, I wrote a book called Techniques of Visual Persuasion, which answers that exact question, and it took me 400 pages to do it, which I don't want to read to you tonight. But it's the only book of its kind that I've ever seen because it's designed for executives, it's designed for non-artists to help them understand how they can create powerful images that motivate change. What is persuasion? How do we do persuasive writing? How do we design PowerPoint slides? How do we use fonts to express emotion? How do we use colors to express emotion? How do we design PowerPoint slides that do what we want them to do? It covers photography, PowerPoint, Photoshop, video production, audio production, motion graphics. In one book, you won't be a professional in any of these. But you'll be sensitive to all of these so that when you talk to your artists or you talk to your videographers or you talk to your audio people, you understand the decisions they're making and you can help them make better decisions. And I have been blown away by the response to this book. It's available on Amazon. It's published by Peach Pit. And it has been extremely successful because the people it's targeted for are not the artists, but the people who have always viewed artists as mysterious ethereal creators. And all of us can be artists. I can't draw a straight line. I can't create art. But I can take existing art and I can use it for my purposes and benefit from it. And that book shows you how to do that. You know, we live in a world um, that's online. Um, a lot of the communications that Think Tech and other companies make uh, are online. Of course, you have the connection between the you know, the graphic and, and, and the text. But, but these days, not that we do this necessarily, but these days, um, you can take the same space that you might have reserved earlier for a static graphic and put a short video clip there instead. Your thoughts then, in terms of visual persuasion, um, is it worth going down that road? Do you, sure. get, do you get the benefit there? Which do you prefer? Well, my, my recommendation is walk before you run. It's easier to come up with a single still image that tells your message. Now, when you've got video, you've got movement and you've got time, two things that you haven't had to deal with before. So how do you use the movement? How does the text as it flies in? How does the animation reinforce your message? And so what you find yourself making is a whole lot more decisions than you had to make with a still image. So my suggestion is, Find an image or set of images that work for you and use those and see if they work. Does the picture of the of the moving horse express power and, and change and, and mastery or whatever it is that you're trying to convey? If that does, now substitute the picture of the, the, the still picture of the horse with a moving horse. And now with the moving horse, now you can put some text that flies in. And you start to watch, because we can track this instantly, watch your clicks. Do your clicks go up or down as you put in the video? They went down. Oh, wrong video. Let's get the still image back. Oh, they went up. Great. Now let's animate some text. Went down. Let's try different text. Try a different font. They went up. So you can start to do incremental measurement on an instant-by-instant -instant basis as you start to evolve this image over time. 
doesn't have to be locked. It's not like a Super Bowl TV ad where you're spending $5 million and it's make or break and you don't know until the Super Bowl's over if anybody was watching. That's a high risk endeavor for people that really know what they're doing. For the people like us that are evolving our message and evolving our, our, uh, our communication skills, this incremental ability to try it, see does it get response, make a change, just one change, change the font, change the wording, change a color. Does it improve or di dis unimprove? Go down. Then you just keep doing that until you start to, oh yeah, this works, that doesn't work. This works, that doesn't work. And keep building on that which works. And because it's incremental and because it's dirt cheap, you know, experiment and then get, get hourly reports back or the worst daily reports, but be, be willing to make changes on a daily basis. This may be a hard question, Larry, but um, you talk about time, you talk about duration. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, the emotional impact of these graphics and so forth, uh, their uh, relationship, although we haven't, we haven't had the time to actually go into it. With the text that you're using, we've talked about, um, you know, the font, which is also kind of a graphic, isn't it? Um, but what about duration? We're talking emotional, emotional capability here. We're talking about the human species um, and the brain, how the brain looks for this, that, and the other thing as a, as a matter of priority. But how much time do I have before my time runs out? Six seconds. Uh, we live in an ADD society. If you don't have their attention in six seconds, you're going to have to work really hard to get it back again. So that's one of the reasons why we want to keep working with images. Because when I pop an image up, your eye goes to that image to check it out. Moving or still doesn't make any difference. Then you've got to use that image to hook their attention because they're looking for ways to get distracted so they can check their phone because they know Facebook is calling them. So the, one of the reasons we keep using images is we're trying to break through this ADD instant gratification. And the only way we can do that, aside from jumping on top of the podium and tearing our tie off and making a fool of ourselves, is to use images that have power. And to use images as a way of distracting the distracted audience to bring them back to us so they can pay attention to our message. Now, for instance, you and I have been talking for 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes. And my hope is that I've kept you interested during that whole time. But notice that during that time, I've had a number of illustrations to explain my point, and the illustrations have been to explain the, the captivating nature of images and typefaces and colors. And you've been looking at it, and this is, this is the last takeaway, and then we can wrap up because brains will explode. But the reason that you're talking to me, the reason that you're talking to me is not because uh, Larry is a good speaker. I'm not a bad speaker, but the first thought in your mind was not that Larry is a good speaker. First thought in your mind is, does Larry have anything interesting to say that will benefit me? Dale Carnegie coined this almost 80 years ago. He called it WIIFM. What's in it for me? The reason you're spending 40 minutes or more talking with me right now is not because you want to give me my 15 minutes of fame, but because you're hoping that by listening to me, you can glean something that you can use in your company tomorrow. What's in it for me? And everyone in your audience is thinking exactly the same thing. If they're still listening, it's because there's something in it for them that they can apply in their business which means that when you're doing your presentation, it isn't, this is what Jay needs. Nobody cares what Jay needs except Jay. What you've got to do is what's in it for your audience? How do they benefit? How do they gain? And when you can position your talk from the point of view of what's in it for me, meaning the audience, the world's your oyster. Because nobody cares what you need. Nobody cares what you want. Nobody cares how important it is to you. That's just a given. But you make me care. You show how I'm going to benefit. Man, I'll follow you around for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I will follow you around for the rest of your life, Larry. Larry Jordan. Every time we talk, I feel enriched by the lessons. Thank you so much. And I hope we can do this again. I know you're working on another book. I want to talk about that. And so many things we couldn't cover today, but there will be another time, I hope, and I look forward to that. Larry Jordan, par excellence, thank you so much. Thank you, Jay, my pleasure.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.